let's take out our Bibles and learn together. God is faithful to judge the enemies of Israel. We have seen that in the past and we will see it in the last days. Continuously, God's faithfulness is on display. When Israel moves away from obedience, fidelity to their covenantal responsibilities to God, God judges them. He punishes them. And a very important term is exile. Israel lose temporarily their right to the land. God sends them into a foreign country where they are afflicted, where they suffer, but where they eventually repent. And God brings back a remnant of the people. We see God's faithfulness in judgment and in restoration. This was true in the past and A wise individual, a proper student of prophecy, knows that this will be the case in the future. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 21. The book of Isaiah and chapter 21. Now, most scholars see this prophecy in this chapter, the 21st chapter, relating primarily to Babylon and the region around Babylon. It is something that takes place in the past, but it has relevance and instructions for the last days. We see that in one verse that appears in the book of Revelation. Dealing with Babylon. Now, Babylon becomes synonymous with Israel's punisher, the one who takes Israel into exile and inflicts upon Israel great suffering. And we know something. In the last days, there is going to be an empire of the Antichrist, and he is going to exert great pressure, cause great suffering and pain, for the Jewish people, and many will go into exile. But in the same way that this prophecy foretells a future restoration, a judgment upon Israel's enemies, so too in the last days. And the one who brings deliverance, the one who is the mediator of restoration for God's covenant people is Messiah when he returns the second time in order to bring judgment, deliverance, and restoration for Israel, and then after this, the establishment of his kingdom. We see as well the book of Revelation not only using the term Babylon in a symbolic way, but also Gog and Magog. In fact, there's been some some heightened Uh, attention to this war, the battle or war of Gog and Magog that we read about in Exodus 38 and 39. Let me say something with all assurance. This war, the battle of Gog and Magog, is also known as the battle of Armageddon. It has great relevance for unbelieving Israel. But hear this carefully. The battle of Gog and Magog has no personal relationship to believers, to those who are part of the congregation of the redeemed. Now, why do we know this? Because the battle of Gog and Magog will take place during the time of God's wrath. And ultimately, it's the second coming, not the rapture. But the second coming where Messiah destroys those who belong to the enemies of Israel. In this case, Gog and Magog and those nations that enter into a confederacy with her. So those individuals that are talking about Gog and Magog today, that things are shaping up for it, 
there are many prophetic things that will happen prior to Gog and Magog. Those who emphasize it as a soon reality, well, they are taking a very uh, prophetic passage of great significance and a strong message, and they're using it as a gimmick. They're sensationalizing that text that has no relevance firsthand for believers in order to get people confused, get them excited, and usually get them to buy something or send an offering, a donation. So we need to be people that understand the prophetic order of events and what will impact us firsthand as believers and what will not. Well, I mentioned that we're going to be in Isaiah and chapter 21. And this prophecy primarily is one that relates to Babylon, literally to Babylon. And when we see what God does with Babylon literally in the past, we can understand what God is going to do to the enemy of Israel in the last days, that Antichrist empire that in the book of Revelation, John calls mystery Babylon. Well, let's begin. Look with me to verse 1. Isaiah chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. We have that same word for a burden, a message of destruction, one of punishment and oftentimes annihilation. So verse 1, the burden of Midbar Yam. Midbar is a desert or a wilderness and the word yam is sea. Now, some Bibles translate it west, the wilderness or desert of the west. And even though from a Israel standpoint, the yam, the sea, and we're speaking about the Mediterranean, is westward. But Babylon is to the east, a very important term that we see numerous times throughout the scripture, are the children or the sons of the east. And this prophecy has relevance for those which are constantly seen as an enemy for the children of Israel. Now, the term here, Midbar Yam, has to do with Babylon and the fact that Babylon in a desert, but there is a river, the Euphrates rivers that go through Babylon. And because of that, that river turned Babylon into a power. It was a great asset for them. So when it says the wilderness of the sea, this river was so vast and influential, it was as though they had a sea within their, their borders. So that's why we have this term, the wilderness of the sea. Verse 1 once more. A burden of the wilderness of the sea. As, and we have a word for, in modern Hebrew, it's a word for tornadoes. It is a whirlwind. It is that which makes destruction. A strong wind that leaves rubble and ruin in their paths. And this is in the plural, so there will be tornadoes in the south that pass through from the wilderness and comes to Eretz nor Ra'ah. This is an awesome or terrible land. So what God is saying here is that there's going to be strong winds, there's going to be turbulent tornadoes that bring about destruction. But notice that most scholars see these tornadoes as not being an outcome of weather, but rather the dust, the storm that arises because of a vast army marching. When an army marches to war with their chariots and such, their horsemen rushing into battle, it kicks up 
does. So it creates a type of whirlwind or, as we see here, a type of storm, strong storm, like a tornado. So this prophecy is not so much about a weather phenomena, but a strong military uh, uh, invasion that comes to Babylon, verse 2. And this prophecy that has to do with a destruction of Babylon, it is very powerful. We read in verse 2, a strong, and the word here, kashe, is a hard or harsh. It speaks of that which is powerful, but in a destructive, harsh way. So the best way to translate it is a strong or harsh vision was told to me. Now, Isaiah is receiving this, and he says this harsh or this difficult vision was told to me, and he says, the one who is the traitor, he is one who is treacherous. So the word here, boged, has to do with someone who is faithless, someone who practices a disloyalty, treacherous individual, one who betrays. And what it says here is that the betrayer is going to find himself, this one who betrays, he's going to find himself experiencing that. And the shoded, ha shoded, the one that plunders, well, plunder is going to find him out. And how is this going to be maintained, carried out? Keep reading. Go up, Elam. Elam is also an empire, very close geographically to Babylon. So Elam is going to go up, and also the, the Madai is going to, the Medes, in other words, in English, is going to lay siege. So these two empires, the Medes and Elam, are going to come together in order to bring destruction upon Babylon. And this indeed has happened in the past. And what God is saying is, in the same way that he was faithful to bring judgment upon Babylon because of their harsh treatment against the, the nation of Judah, so will he, and this is the implication, so we can anticipate God doing that in the last days. Now, here again, this prophecy from our standpoint is for the past, but from the past we learn biblical truth which has future, in days, implications. So once more, we read, Go up, Elam, lay siege, O Medes, for all groanings or signs, it says, will be brought to an end or have ended. And what it speaks about is this, that God is going to make an end of these groanings that were caused by the Babylonians upon his people. And there's going to be, by means of Elam and the Medes, there's going to be soon thereafter deliverance. And we know this is the case. Because when Babylon came to an end under the leadership of the Medes and the Persians, we see something. We see that under Cyrus, there was the ability, the freedom, the law went forth for the people to go back out of exile, back to the land. And going back to the land has ultimately, in the last days, it has a uh, uh, kingdom implications to it. So this is what this passage is foreshadowing. Verse 3. Now, some will say that, that the prophet, when he looks at the harsh judgment that is coming upon Babylon, that it even elicits some compassion for him, from him. Likewise, others translate that and say that Isaiah, when he speaks here, he is quoting the king of Babylon. 
who is going to be dethroned and brought to an end. So however you want to translate it, the implications are the same. Babylon is going down in a very harsh manner. Verse 3, therefore, my, my loins, and this has to do with his waist, therefore, my loins are full of anguish or grief or, or sorrow. And he talks about how pains, this is the same word for birth pains, have, has seized me as the pains of a woman who gives birth. For I have been tortured from what I have heard, and I am fearful from what I have seen. So Isaiah is just looking at this, and he sees, many scholars would say, he sees both what happened to Babylon going back many, many years ago, 2,400 years ago. And, and secondly, he sees how this is going to be poured out, God's judgment upon the Antichrist empire in the last days. So very important that we see what's going on here. What took place, maybe more accurate to say 2,500 years ago, and what will take place in the last days Isaiah is getting a glimpse of this, verse 4. Now, whether it's Isaiah looking at this and not comprehending, or the king of Babylon that Isaiah is speaking for, there is confusion. He says, Ta'a levavi, levavi, my heart is, is confused. And then we have two words, palatsut, and this word has to be with, with fear or trembling or that which is, is, is extremely, extremely makes one afraid as well as the next word, be atat ni. So these two words, fear and trembling, his heart's confused by what he has seen. And then we have the word neshef, which is like a ball. An evening ball in modern Hebrew, it's a word for like a prom, a, a dance. And he says, I desired a, a nighttime party. There, or should be some, it was placed to me. And there's a word for extreme fear. It's the modern Hebrew word for uh, modern for shock, going into shock. So he says here, I desired a celebration, but, but what was placed, it says, Sam Lee, what was placed to me was, was terror, that which brought a, a shocking thought to my mind. Verse 5. Now he's going to say, what's happening if it's the king of Babylon that meets his, his demise. He says the table was prepared. But what happened? The watchman was, was watching from his posts, eating and drinking. This was the king. Eating and drinking. And the cabinet officials, his leading officials, they got up and they anointed their shield. Why would you anoint a shield, put oil on it? So the arrows would, would glance off of it, would not uh, uh, hit as hard. That oil would have that effect. So the idea here is either Isaiah is, is seeing this vision of what's going on in the king's palace in Babylon, or he's quoting the thoughts of the king of Babylon concerning the fact that this war his destruction of his empire came suddenly, and here's the key, without any thought or expectation. And that's how it's going to be for the Antichrist empire. He is going to think that he has established himself, that everything's going to his plan, and suddenly and quickly he is going to see his defeat comes about. So we read in this passage that the king of Babylon was partying, having a party when, in fact, 
he received the news from his watchmen of this devastation that's coming, this call to go out for warfare. Look now to verse 6. Thus, thus, verse 6, for thus said unto me the Lord, go and stand at the watch place, that is the watchtower, and what he will see, he will declare. Verse 7. And he looked, and what did he see? A chariot and a pair of horsemen, a chariot of a donkey and a chariot of a camel. And he listened attentively, most attentively, and there was much to hear. Now, most scholars believe where it says at the end of this verse, verse 7, Rav Kashev, there was much to hear. What it's saying is that there was much implications to this, that this had far-reaching uh, uh, conclusions, this prophecy, far beyond the time of, of the literal judgment of Babylon going back 2,500 years ago, verse 8. Now, we know historically the Babylonian Empire was, was described, its symbol was a lion. And we read in verse 8, Vayikra Arye, and proclaimed a lion. This is, for many scholars, a strong clue that confirms this prophecy is about Babylon. So a lion was proclaimed concerning this watchtower, this, this vision that was seen. O Lord, I stand continuously throughout the day, and on my, my watch I stand all nights. So day and night, the prophet is saying, I'm looking at this. He's getting revelation concerning this event. And the fact that he says, you know, all throughout the days and all throughout the night, I stand continuously. It shows that this is of the utmost importance and that it has far-reaching conclusions to it beyond his days. Verse 9. Behold this. A chariot comes, a chariot of a man, and a pair of horsemen, and he answered and said, so this is one coming and saying, and he's revealing the outcome. He says, Nafla, Nafla, Babel. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Now, that same verse is taken and placed within the book of Revelation in chapter 18 and verse 2. And once more, this is to show us that in the same way that God was faithful in the past to judge the enemies of Israel, and this judgment brought about their, their return to the land, a renewal of the promises of God, God's covenantal promises. We can expect when, when John takes that, and places is in Revelation chapter 18. It shows that God is faithful to judge in the last days Israel's enemy and to bring about a destruction upon the kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom, that wants to make the covenantal promises of God void. But God, in the same way that he judged Babylon, he is going to judge the Antichrist. That's why John, in the book of Revelation, took this passage. And we know that after chapter 18 in the book of Revelation, Babylon falling, we have Messiah returning his second coming. And this is going to bring about a great event. It sees here the marriage banquet and God's ultimate defeat of the enemy and, in the next chapter, the establishment of of the kingdom. So once more, there is great relevance for this phrase. And he answered and he said, Fallen, 
fallen is Babylon. And every, and here we have a carved statue of their God, is broken to the land. And what this means is, and this is reminiscent of Dagon in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel, where we see, where we see Dagon being brought to the ground in defeat. In that same way, the enemies of Israel, the enemies of God, are going to find their idolatrous attitude, their worship that was based in falsehood and the desire of self. It is going to be consumed by God's wrath and be brought to the ground and be no more. Verse, verse 10. Now in verse 10, we have an image for the reader. We have the phrase here, medu shati. This is the gleanings. This is the, the harvest. If you go to a threshing floor, you will find that things are there for the person to, to thresh and receive the grain, the produce. And this is what it's talking about here. In the end, because of this judgment upon Babylon and ultimately the Antichrist empire, there is going to be an opportunity to receive the spoils of the war, the blessings. So he says here, my, my gleanings, the, the seed, and this is talking about the grain, which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And remember that phrase, Elohe Israel, usually gives the passage a last day context. So once more, Isaiah is saying what took place in Babylon's defeat 2,500 years ago and how this brought about a restoration back to the land and a renewal of the promises of God. And the promises of God, they relate to blessings. So here the blessings are available, the produce of the land. So once more it says, all of this is from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. I will declare it to you. And this declaration is the outcome of the word, the promises of God. It is going to be presented upon the threshing floor so that the people can take hold of it and enjoy the produce. Now look at verse 11. In verse 11, we have a very important prophecy against, ultimately, a dome. Now you say, a dome doesn't appear. That name, which is the people, the descendants of Esau, doesn't appear there. That's correct. But we have two locations that were in the empire or the kingdom of Edom. It says the burden of Duma. Duma belonged to Edom. In the same way, the mountain of Edom was Seir. And we have here calling out from Seir. Seir, this mountain of Esau, you can look at it, for example, in Ezekiel 35 and other places where it speaks about the destruction and the annihilation eternally of the people of Edom. So the burden of Duma unto me proclaim from Seir, this mountain, the one who keeps what is from the night and keeps what is from the night. Now, night has to do with vision in this context. So this one is receiving a vision and he holds to it. It's valuable. This word shomer, valuable. You keep that which you guard, that which is important. And it's very important, the destruction of Duma and Sair, Mount Sair. Because when Edom goes, we know, for example, in the prophecy of Obadiah, that this represents a final battle. Now, Edom joined with Babylon in order to, to pour judgment upon Judah. Edom was never called to do that. Why did Edom do so? Well, if you look, this is found, for example, in many places, but one is Psalm 137, 
where, where Edom, the ones from Judah that were escaping, that God never intended, there's always that remnant. So those who were escaping, Edom hunted down and he put to death. God never told them to do that. He was not part of that. And now we see as Babylon gets their judgment, we see in the last days that Edom, having sided, joined with this Antichrist empire, is also going to be one that is, is judge. Verse 12. And he said, who said this keeper, this one who guards, he says, come morning, come night. Now, this is saying something, and it's an idiom. When something has to be done, you'll do it whether it's day or night. You don't say if it's important, you don't say, well, it's nighttime, I'm only going to do this in the day. When something is important, you do it, you carry it out whether it happens in the day or night. And this is what this prophecy is saying. It's something very important. So come, daytime, come nighttime. If you, and it uses a word, when I was preparing, this word is a word for a petitioning, but it's so, it shows a strong supplication, a great desire for something. And this word appears twice. So if you utterly or sincerely or diligently desire, what should you do? Repent and come. Those who don't have this strong desire, they will not answer the call. They will not respond. Now, I want to point out something so that there's no confusion. We see this prophecy against Babylon being used as a way of encouraging, giving insight that God will be faithful to judge the enemies of Israel in the last days. Ultimately, that last enemy will be an empire that is under the leadership of the Antichrist. And even though that it is symbolically called Babylon, it is not going to be literally Babylon. It is going to be out of Europe. But it's going to have the same objective, the same evil spirit. And that is to thwart the purposes of God. Like Babylon wanted to do. Like Edom wanted to do. And therefore, we're being told and used that name Babylon in the book of Revelation but it is not referring to literally Babylon, but that term is being used in order to convey the same message that was applied to Babylon. And when I mention Gog and Magog, also they appear. But it's not speaking about in Revelation 20 where Gog and Magog is mentioned. It is not mentioning literally Gog and Magog. Why is it there? Well, what do we take away from the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39? We take away that Gog and Magog and the empires that join with it, these nations, they were defeated. Israel was victorious. In that same way, they take that concept of Gog and Magog who were defeated and Israel was victorious. They place that in Revelation 20, having to do with something that took place a thousand years after the battle of Gog and Magog. But bring that term so we know that in the same way a thousand years earlier at the battle of Armageddon, the war of Gog and Magog, Israel was victorious. God defeated her enemies. So too, so too when Satan and, and that vast army goes up to the holy city to make war with the saints, so too will God be victorious. In the same way that Gog and Magog fell a thousand years earlier, so will this, this war that's led by Satan himself. Well, let's move into the final section of chapter 21. Look now to verse 13. Verse 13 through 17 has a prophecy 
that concerns Arav, that is Arabia. And it speaks about the Arabian area. What we talk about today of Saudi Arabia, but also there is the UAE, also Qatar, also Tehran, other nations. And they were close in proximity to Babylon. But they also are going to be judged. How do we know that? Look at verse 13. The burden on Araf in the forests of Arabia, they will lodge. Meaning that they are going to flee into the forest because of this judgment. Orchot de Dani. The Danites, they were a group of people that, that because of fear of the Arabians, they would not stay in cities when they passed through. They would, would stay in the force because of fear. And what it's saying is in the same way that this group did so, so will the inhabitants of Arabia. Verse 14, to meet the thirsty and to bring out water, the inhabitants of the land of Tema. Tema is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. It is part of Saudi Arabia. And this group of people, for the, the ones who were fearful of the, the power of Arab of Arabia, they would profit by bringing out supplies to them. And it's simply an image saying that, that the Arabians are going to be in that same predicament, that same difficult situation of, of fearful. Fearfulness because of judgment that is coming upon them. Verse 14, part 2, second half. With, with bread, go out and meet the wanderer. For, and this is in verse 15, for because of swords, they will remove themselves or they will wander about aimlessly. Because of a drawn sword, because of a, a bow which is bent, because of the severity, the heaviness of war. So these individuals are going to be experiencing the consequences of, of judgment, of war being brought to them, and they are going to be defeated. Verse 16. For thus said the Lord unto me, in one more year. And then it says, as the year of a labor. Now what does that mean? It speaks about that which is precise. When Isaiah received this prophecy, it was one that he was going to realize soon thereafter that Babylon, that judgment was going to begin upon Babylon. When it says, according to the year of a labor, if you sign a contract for so much money, let's say you're going to work one year and you're going to make 20,000 euros, $20,000, whatever it is. When that year to the day comes to an end, you want to get your payment and you don't want to work anymore. You are going to be exact, and that's what this is, is, is revealing to us, that this is going to be an exact prophecy. For thus the Lord spoke unto me, Be'ol Shana, in another year, according to the year of a labor with precision, in other words. And all the glory of Qadar, this is another name for Arabia. If I'm not mistaken, it was, Qadar was, was Ishmael's second son. You can check that out in the book of Genesis. And so it's simply saying, not only is Arav going to be judge, usually associated with Ishmael, but the next generation. And it's simply speaking about this concept of next generation. 
for Israel, it has a good connotation. But for the enemies, it says, you have no future. So the, the sons of Kedar, notice what it says. They are going to be finished. Their, their glory of Kedar is going to be brought to an end. Verse 17, last verse. And the rest of the number of, of bowmen, this is people who have bows and arrows, the mighty ones of the sons of Kedar, they will be few. Not many survivors. For the Lord, the God of Israel, remember that term, Elohei Israel, last day implications, has spoken. So in review, very briefly, this 21st chapter, Isaiah receives a prophecy that Babylon's going down, that God's faithful to judge the enemies of his people, to renew and reestablish his covenantal promises. And the great covenantal promise is the establishment of the kingdom. And who will establish this kingdom? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Messiah. And that's why we see and we can be encouraged that in the same way God brought back the exile from Babylon and returned the people back to Judah and Jerusalem, and that that temple was rebuilt in that same way, we can be assured that God is going to renew and restore his promises to his covenant people in the last days through Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom. Well, we'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel.